So I will be more brief than the other speakers because I met Eric Davidson quite late in my career. The first time it was in Bersheva uh, during one of the first meetings organized by Ute Deichmann. Before I knew Eric from his work, from his article, from the books he published. First, uh, my first encounter, scientific encounter with Eric was the article he published in the 1960s and the book he published in 1968 on molecular embryology. And uh, uh, I wrote more recently a small paper on these contributions of uh, Eric telling that it was for me the third pillar of molecular biology after the discovery of DNA and the genetic code and the discovery of regulatory mechanism. These works pursued during the 60s were very important because they first confirmed some of the previous results of molecular biology, like for instance the dramatic change in uh, RNA in gene expression and RNA production during the early steps of embryogenesis, but also they showed that there were new phenomena existing during the development of higher organisms that had not been anticipated, like, for instance, the fact that some uh, messenger RNAs were restored in the embryo and activated later during development. And so, these early works were very really important to attract molecular biologists so far working on bacteria and bacteriophages to attract them towards the study of higher Organism. The second encounter with uh, the work of Eric Davidson was a famous model he proposed in 1969 with Roy Britton in the journal Science. And I was trained in the French School of Molecular Biology and I must say that this model was not so well received by the French people. And uh, maybe it's surprising for you, but François Jacob, up to the end of his life, considered that the value of the operant model had not been fully acknowledged. Not uh, the value of the model as explaining regulation in bacteria, the operant model, which has been quite well received, but the effort they did with Jacques Monod in 1961 during the Cold Spring Harbor conference to extend these models to the development of higher organs. And uh, Jacob had the feeling that these efforts had not been considered seriously, and uh, when the developmental genes were molecularly characterized at the beginning of the 1980s, for instance, the box containing genes, for him it was the perfect demonstration that their anticipation with Mono were right, uh, there were transition factors controlling the early steps of development, but the, uh, the discovery of this developmental gene was not recognized as such. Even there was no reference at that time to these early models of uh, 1961. In addition, uh, Jacob did not like the Britton Davidson model, he found it too speculative, and uh, Personally, my first feelings were similar. You don't escape the school in which you grow up scientifically. And so I had the feeling that the model of Britain and Davidson maybe did not pay a right tribute to the contribution of uh, Manon Jacob in 1961. And so that was the reason I was so happy. Uh, when I organized this meeting with uh, people from the Pasteur Institute in Paris to celebrate the 50th anniversary of the Nobel Prize attributed to Wolf, Mono and Jacob. And uh, ask Eric Davidson to come and to speak about his model and the model proposed by Mono and Jacob, and he accepted. And I was very happy because I think it was the right time to compare the two models, to say what was similar, what was different between the two models, and their relative role in the development of uh, molecular embryology and molecular biology of development. Unfortunately, Eric died before uh, this meeting, and uh, it was, we have not his personal 
feeling about the respective role of these two models. Personally, retrospectively, I have the feeling that the two models were different and pointed to different aspects of gene regulation in, uh, during development. So the Mono and Jacob model was very important to show that the one very important level of regulation was the transcription of DNA into RNA and to show also that proteins directly control this process by binding to DNA. But Davidson, Britain Davidson model was important to show that this phenomenon has to be considered more globally in, as an holistic process, so you have to somehow design the what was called later the genetic regulatory networks involved in development and also what was very important in the Britain Davidson model and something which was not done in uh, the work of Jacob and Mono was a link with evolution. Somehow this circuit, genetic circuit, have to be able to evolve or to permit transformation and evolution. And this was a very important aspect in the Britain and Davidson model. This was not discussed by Mono and Jacob. So, retrospectively, I think two models were different, but they somehow introduced different aspects of molecular development. So, I also followed the work done later by Eric Davidson, the characterization of promoter with us. so many sites for transcription factors and uh, the gene regulatory network and the progression of the work with the modeling and with the checking this model and so on. Um, I would not say more about this, but only that for the community of historian and philosopher of science, Evelyn Fox Keller played, I think, an important role in her book of 2002 because she uh, wrote a chapter on the work of Eric Davidson and she attracted the attention of historian and philosopher of science on this recent development in uh, uh, molecular uh, development of biology. So, as I mentioned previously, I met Eric for the first time some years ago and I would like to underline four characteristics of uh, Eric which struck me. The first one was his enthusiasm. And uh, despite the problems he had to walk and to move, uh, it was really some, an experience, very strong experience to see the enthusiasm he put in his work and the fact that year after year it was possible to see the progression of his work, the progression of his model, but also the more and more global conception he had of the regulation of gene expression during development. The second characteristic that has already been uh, uh, mentioned by Hélène uh, was uh, this will to not only to bring new results in science, but somehow to bring a new vision of uh, scientific facts, to include these scientific facts into a broader vision of biological phenomena. I will dare a comparison with, uh, with another uh, great scientist who was Ernst Mayer. I don't know whether uh, Eric would have appreciated this comparison because, well, he had some difficulties with uh, evolutionists, but nevertheless I think uh, Eric somehow did for molecular and developmental biology, functional biology, the same that Ernst Mayer did for evolutionary biology. Try somehow to show how these developments uh, can, uh, led to a development of biological thought, to use the expression of uh, Ernst Mayer. And the last two traits of two characteristic of Eric somehow surprisingly, maybe be, uh, after what I said before, I found they are very shared with François Jacob. I think it's not so surprising uh, because some of their personalities were not very different. The third characteristic was the capacity of Eric uh, to say what he thought and especially to re not to to be able to say, no, this model, this uh, 
for instance, does not explain what the upper uh, says the model explains, or to be very aggressive when somebody was unable to have a rational explanation of his experiments. And to come uh, back to Jacob for a few seconds, uh, François Jacob was clearly able to say loudly that, for instance, a model of a lecture was bullshit. And I think uh, Eric probably would have been able to say exactly the same. And a small anecdote also on Jacob, but you see, I think also it's probably it was true for Eric. Uh, some years ago, uh, nearly 20 years ago, there was a discussion about the possibility to give a Nobel Prize to Robert Gallo and Luc Montagnier for the discovery of HIV. And I remember I was in François Jacob's lab at that time, and François Jacob was absolutely furious at that. And he was shouting in the lab that it was impossible to give a Nobel Prize to a stupid person and to, to a dishonest one. And I think, I don't know, but I imagine that people who have worked with Eric probably have hundreds of similar anecdotes about Eric telling very strong statements about some people or about some work. And the last um, trait of uh, Eric was the opposite, and I think, but not the opposite, I think it's complementary. When Eric appreciated somebody, really at that time you entered in a very strong relation with Eric, as for instance with Jacob. And uh, pe uh, people as famous as Jacob or, uh, or Eric sometimes uh, become superficial. It becomes impossible to have real human relations with them. You have the feeling that they are always playing or they are big in front of TV so they express what has to be expressed in these circumstances. But it was not the case of Jacob and it was not the case for a week. When you discuss with him, and when uh, in condition where you, you know that he appreciated what you were thinking, you have real, you had really the feeling that this conversation was very important for a week. That he, he wanted to convince you, he wanted to know what you thought about his idea and uh, to exchange with you. The way he was looking at you showed that it, for him somehow he was engaging himself into this conversation. It was something important. And uh, I had two rare uh, discussions of this type with Eric during the, the meetings organized by Goethe, but I know that I will always remember these discussions. <laughs>